So May was kind of intense. I think I loved this. <laughs> then we took a steep dive. So it's a bit of an emotional roller coaster. I think they just like to throw things at me to see my reaction. So despite how busy I was in May, and by busy I mean how obsessed and preoccupied I was in May with with not reading. I was watching the trial all day every day. Didn't leave a ton of time for reading. Plus also in addition to the trial, I had a lot of like things going on, like things I had bought tickets for uh, well in advance that all happened to be in May. So May was kind of intense. Not a lot of videos were posted by me in May and that's why. Well, that's partially why anyway. I also am just sometimes lazy. Nonetheless, I ended up actually reading a pretty respectable amount. Yeah, pretty much everything on my TBR. And then some. There's definitely some things that were not on my TBR that I read. So I read one, two, I read 13 books considering how much of my time was spent on the trial. I don't understand how I read this many books. I genuinely do not. I don't know when this happened or how this happened, but um, what I did. So I guess that means without the trial in, in June, I can read 26 books, right? No, God, no, absolutely not. Anyway, let's go through them, shall we? The first book, uh, the first couple books actually, um, that I read in May, I have uh, videos up for already, so I won't spend too much time on them. The first is The View from the Cheap Seats by Neil Gaiman. I read this because it was one of the few Gaimans that I have yet to, I had yet to read. And I was seeing one of the many things I had tickets for in May was Neil, an evening with Neil Gaiman. So I was like, oh, I should, I should read a Gaiman, ideally one that I haven't read before. So this is a selected nonfiction. I'm obsessed with this. This is now among my favorite Neil Gaiman books. I cannot recommend this highly enough. I have an entire video gushing about it. So go check that out. But suffice to say, five out of five stars. Can I give it 10 out of five? I would like to. Um, this is amazing. It's incredible. I'm so mad I, I, it took so long for me to pick this up. Great start to the month. <laughs> then we took a steep dive <laughs> in quality. I also have a video about this and that is Lessons in Chemistry by Bonnie Garmus or Garmu. Um, I have a very long rant review for this up. I actually, I filmed it, I think the same day that I filmed the View from the Cheap Seats video, but it went up a lot later. <laughs> Any hoosies, um, yeah, I loathe and despise this book. I have a very long video talking about why, so I, I don't wanna waste your time here. You can go check that out if you're interested. Um, and if you're not interested in that video, then I don't think you're interested in hearing me talk about it here either, so. Next up is a another book by an author that I love, but this was a book that I had not read yet, and that is Teacher Man by Frank McCourt. I had I've been reading his, this I guess quote unquote trilogy of memoirs he has. Um, the first two were rereads for me, so me and um, one of my patrons have been working our way through them. We're done now, which is only three. Um, so Angela's Ashes used to be my official favorite book. It's still a favorite. Uh, so that was a reread. Tis I like less than Angela's Ashes, but I still like it a lot and it was also a reread, but I had never read Teacher Man before. Teacher Man is the shortest one. And as the title should make clear, this is about his years working as a teacher. It has all the charm you would expect from Frank McCourt. And it is um, a bit lighter and more upbeat than than tis tis is the it is the darkest one i think i think that's why i don't like it as much ironically considering my taste <laughs> teacher man he's got some amazing stories um as he always does he's an amazing storyteller and there were a few stories that legit had me tearing up not because they're like horribly well one of them is pretty tragic it, you know it's, it's kind of the way that the v from the cheap seats made me tear up there's just like a poignancy and just this sort of like real raw quality to these human experiences he's relating so I definitely recommend all of his books and I definitely recommend Teacher Man. Next up is a book that I did not have on my TBR, but my hold for the audio came in from the library. So I was like, yeah, let's get her done. That is This Woven Kingdom by Ted Amafi. In a, what is I'm sure, what I'm sure continues to be a shocking surprise to people. I really like the Shatter Me series. I have not finished it yet because I heard such terrible things about the final installment that I was like, I'll get to it when I get to it. I really like Shatter Me. Um, I didn't initially like it when I first started reading Shatter Me. I, I started a, a vlog, I think, um, that I was like, this is gonna be one of those like ranty hating vlogs. And then like halfway through the vlog, I'm like, I'm, I think I'm into this. And by the end of the vlog, I was like, I think I love this. <laughs> so it's a bit of an emotional roller coaster. Anyway, all that to say, I was very excited to see that the Hedemafi had a new book coming out that was a fantasy because her prose is very much not for everybody. That's one of the main reasons I think Shatter Me is so polarizing. I at first was put off by her writing style, but I eventually grew to really, really appreciate it. Um, I really, I do like her writing style. So I was excited to see, cause it's a quite a purpley writing style and Shatter Me is more sort of dystopian sci-fi. So I was excited to see her purple prose in a fantasy, in a in a purple book. I, well, I did like this, I think more than people seem to be. I've been seeing a lot of lukewarm reviews for this. And I think I like it better than most people seem to be. But I was also surprised that the prose style is almost nothing like 
the pro style in Shatter Me. So I don't I don't know what that means. I don't know if that means that she only developed that style specifically for Shatter Me and that's not really her style per se. Or if she was sick of the flack she got for it in Shatter Me and wanted to go a different way. I have no idea, but it's quite different in, in tone and in style. If I didn't know this was by Tadamafi, I wouldn't necessarily guess that it was by Tadamafi. But that being said, like I said, I, I enjoyed it a lot more, I think, than other people have been. And I often, at least in the last couple years, have really disliked most um, new and hyped YA releases, which is part of many reasons, uh, one of many reasons I why I have veered away from reading more YA just because it was letting me down so much that I was like, I don't, I keep getting burned, you know, so like why keep going back? Although many of my favorite books of all time are YA books, they're just from a few years ago. So that being the case, yeah, I was like, I, I read this, which I thought was, I mean, it was pretty hyped because of who the author is. And I read it, you know, being like, oh, here we go. I, I'm hopeful, but you know, I haven't been doing so good with YA. And I was like, I actually really liked that. And was surprised to learn that this hyped YA book, I like it. And it looks like most people are not liking it. I haven't seen much like hate for it outright, but I've seen a lot of people being like, nah, 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 that wasn't it. And I was like, this was pretty good, I think. It didn't blow me away. It didn't knock my socks off. I still like probably like Shatter Me a bit better, or at least felt more obsessed by <laughs> Shatter Me. I don't know if that's healthy. This Woven Kingdom is just sort of chiller. So the writing style is also chiller, but I thought it was a really lush world she created. The characters were good. I was invested in the story. I thought she was doing some interesting things with the politics and it left off in a place that I wasn't like dying for the next book, but I was like, yeah, I would go on. I would like to know what happens next. Yeah. And it's, it's a lot better than a lot of other books that I've read lately that are YA and also that have a, I haven't specifically read any like Persian settings because this is a Persian setting, but a Middle Eastern settings. I have been excited by and then let down by a lot of books with Middle Eastern settings because that, I want it. <laughs> I want to like it. And then I pick up those books and I'm like, but I don't like this book. <laughs> so I, en I enjoyed this a great deal. Um, I don't know what people's problem is. <laughs> Next up is a book that I hated. <laughs> it was 12 Kings in Sherakai by Bradley B. P. Bo. Bo. I've never actually tried to say the author's name before. Bolio? Bradley P. Bolio? Um, all right. Anyway, um, I ostensibly buddy read this with, um, Elliot Brooks and Jesse May, but Jesse DNF'd it. And I'm not sure where Elle is at with it. <laughs> But after listening to me and Jesse rant about it, I can't imagine Elle was in any kind of hurry to pick it up. <laughs> I ranted about it at length in um, a vlog earlier this month when I was reading it. This is also a Middle Eastern setting, and I think what this Woven Kingdom is way better. <laughs> this book, um, it kind of did everything that I hate in one book. I don't think the storytelling is very good. The prose isn't very good. The characterization sucks. The world building is like info dumpy and over described and overdone and utterly unorganically woven into the story. And it's just like a bloated mess. Um, I really did not like this. And I, I liked it less and less as I read on. And there were so many instances where I was like, I really should care about what's going on. There's some intense, in theory, intense things going on. And I could not care less. So I, I do not recommend. Next up is a book that I absolutely recommend. <laughs> that is Best Served Cold by Joe Abercrombie. This was my third, third and a half time reading it because I did start it a couple years ago and then didn't end up finishing it that time and then restarted it the next time I was reading it. So I've, I've technically read it more than three times, but like not a full four. It's an amazing book. I had a great time chatting about it with Bethany. This was her first time reading it. So we were reading it for the the read along we're hosting on the chapter three podcast. So if you missed it, the episode where we talk about Best Your Cold is up. So I'll leave that linked down below. This is the first of the standalones in the first law. And it's great. It's great. It's amazing. And my main man, Carl Shivers, who is my second favorite character after Sign and Glockta, really gets to shine in this one, which is so good. Next up is the book that I buddy read uh, with my patrons for patron book club is what I'm trying to call it now. And we are uh, read alonging, buddy reading, reading together The Dandelion Dynasty by Ken Liu. So we started with The Grace of Kings. And why did I grab the paperback? I have a hardcover of this now because I liked it. And I was like, I want them all in hardcover. And I'm looking at it right over there. I have the hardcover. <laughs> but um, anyway, here's the paperback. I really, really enjoyed this. I ended up giving it full five stars. It didn't feel like, it was more, I guess it was sort of a 4.5 that I rounded up because I don't think it was perfect. But I was like, ah, give it the five. Because you know, I, I'm just as inclined to be generous as I am to be harsh. I feel feelings just uh, quite strongly in either direction. So if I hate something, I'll be like, oh, just give it one. Uh, it doesn't deserve even a two. And if I like something, I'll be like, does it get a five? Like, yeah, give it five. So just fives and ones all the way down. So yeah, I, I had heard that it was slower. I'd heard that it was more arm's length. Both things are true. And 
despite that, I think that the arm's lengthness of it, I shouldn't say despite that. So the, the arm's lengthness um of it makes it okay that all some of the character behavior and character dialogue is a little bit stilted and and inauthentic and inorganic sounding god that sounds really harsh i remember i gave it five stars but like there is a, a kind of like the, the the characterization of the dialogue is at times you're like pe people don't really talk like that people don't quite behave like that normally that would really bother me and I would call that out and I guess I am calling it out but like it, it works in this because this has almost that kind of like again arm's length kind of almost fairy tale-esque myth length telling and figures in old legends old myths fairy tales etc don't really behave like people so much so it's sort of in keeping with that narrative style so like I think Bear in the Nightingale by Catherine Arden or the Song of Achilles like this isn't I actually I do believe this is retelling a specific part of history was inspired by it but it's not again like Bear in the Nightingale or Song of Achilles where it's like a specific myth that it's retelling or anything like that but it does have this kind of like mythic arm's length Tolkien-esque if you will writing style and again even in, in, in Lord of the Rings the characters have this more like fairy tale-esque way about them they don't really act and talk like people the way that we expect nowadays in, for example, First Law. That I guess it that could be hit or miss for people. And in my opinion, it works due to the narrative style. And I'm very much looking forward to where this goes. It is it is quite impressive what he's begun here. And I was already really impressed with Paper Menagerie. So I have a lot of faith in Ken Liu. Um, so even when it started out kind of, you know, <laughs> I was like, mm, I, I think this works for me, but we'll see. I do think it's, it's a rewarding read if you stick with it. And I'm excited to read the next books, plural, but especially the next, the second one, because I've heard that's the best one. Yeah, I, I think it demands a little more of you as a reader. There's a lot of names and a lot of things going on. It's complicated and layered and it's not an action packed rip roaring roller coaster that keeps your attention. But if you're willing to go at this pace and you're willing to kind of put your brain on, you know, like you can't um, half acidly read it. You kind of have to pay attention the whole time. I mean, if you're, if you're good with that, then I do absolutely recommend. The Grace of Kings. Uh, next up is a book that I don't have a physical copy of, but um, I was originally going to plan, uh, going to plan, <laughs> I originally planned to read it for Tor.comathon, didn't get around to it, but my hold for the audiobook came in. Um, so I was like, yeah, let's read it. Um, and then A Sorcerer of the Wild Deeps by Kai, oh, I don't have it in front of me, I, Kai Ashanti something. <laughs> Well, presumably it's here somewhere, so you can tell me. And I don't think I'm smart enough. I I have to be honest, like I kind of don't understand or didn't understand what was going on most of the time. And when I did understand it, I was intrigued. And I thought from what I could gather, that there were some interesting things being done by the author. And I wanted to understand what was happening. But it kind of just throws you in and doesn't explain things. And it being a novella, it doesn't have enough time for you to kind of figure it out. Because like you, you get that a bit in like the fifth season, Men K. Jemison, but by the end, you know, you've had enough time to gather your context clues to work out what's going on and where we're going. But this is so short that I've barely begun to try to piece together what the F is going on before it's over. And I, I, I didn't get it. And, and I think it is actually a book that takes place in a world that has been established in a previous book, even though this is the first in this specific series. But I think this, this universe has been established before somewhere else is my understanding. I might be wrong about that. In which case, if that is, if that is in fact the case, then it might have been helpful if I had read um, the previous work that uh, would give you your introduction to what we're doing here what what this is because just based on this first one like I kind of don't know how to, I mean I think I gave it three stars but it was kind of like a it averages out to a three or like I'm giving it three based on I think it's good but I can't tell because I don't know what's happening so uh I might try to come back to this like try to read whatever came before it if there is something and and kind of work my way backwards but just based on that one book I am uh, next up is the Sword of Truth read-along installment we were at for May, and that was Soul of the Fire by Terry Goodkind. Um, Bethany and I both, I think, feel that this is probably our least favorite. It's tough because Temple of the Winds is like bananas, and I have more like actively negative feelings about Temple of the Winds, but I also like, I was never bored by Temple of the Winds, and I have active feelings as I'm reading it, and it's, it keeps your attention. Soul of the Fire is just such it's like a middle book that is also manages to be a bit annoying in things that it's doing and kind of bad. And it just like doesn't have a bunch of the things that make the series good. Like we spend a ton of time with some new characters in this book that like aren't really relevant to like the overall story. And they, they're only introduced in this book. 
and are not really going to be like main cast characters like moving on because sometimes the books introduce a new character that is now going to be part of the merry band moving forward this is not the case and there's a bunch of characters that are part of the sort of main sort of core group that appear in multiple books and they're just like not even in it at all and I'm like why are we spending all this time <laughs> with these characters that I that are new and that I don't like that I don't need to care about moving forward like where are the characters that I do care about <laughs> So this book, it just, I mean, you have to read it in order to read the next book because it does, um, where it ends, sets up what's going to happen in the next book. But this book itself, like, I, if there was a way to skip it, <laughs> I mean, I guess you could just, like, Wikipedia the summary. But if you want to hear more in-depth thoughts, the chat about it was on Bethany's channel, um, so the replay for that is available to you if you are uh, interested. But yeah, Soul of Fire, it's, it's not it. <laughs> next is a book that, again, my audio hold came in for it, so I was like, let's do it, slash I also had previously had the NetGalley arc for it and I had not managed to read it yet so when the hold came in I was like yeah I really need to read that because um I'm behind and that is Sense and Second Degree Murder by Terza Price um this is the second in what I gather is a series um of murder mysteries that are each retellings in their own right of a Jane Austen novel and reading this I also discovered that they are in a shared universe because Jane Austen novels I mean I guess are in a shared universe insofar as they aren't fantasy books like they ostensibly take place in the real world they're just fictional characters in the real world but like the stories don't like <laughs> back in the day people weren't doing like multiverses and crossovers and like you know character cameos like we do nowadays but these books seem to be doing that not a lot um it's more just like a mention of like something from Pride and Premeditation where you're like oh okay so they're like aware of each other, kind of. Um, they're not like integral to each other's plots or anything. So Sense and Second Degree Murder, if the plot or if the title did not um, clue you into this, is a retelling of Sense and Sensibility. And Sense and Sensibility was always my favorite of the Jane Austen stories. I don't know if it still is. I'd have to revisit them all. But I did always really, really love Sense and Sensibility. So based on that, I do think I like this a bit better than Pride and Premeditation. And I liked Pre Pride and Premeditation a great deal. I just, Pride and Prejudice, I like it, but it's never been my favorite. My favorite in general or my favorite Austin even. I definitely always preferred Sense and Sensibility. So I mean based on that I was just sort of more inclined towards the story that this is retelling. And I do think it did a good job retelling it and there's a specific change that it makes. I mean it obviously has to make quite a few changes in order to have make this be a murder mystery so like it is quite different in general. But the nature of one of the characters is is changed quite a bit in this and it's a, a change that I like a lot. That improves things for me. I don't know, it wouldn't, I guess, really be possible in the original story, given how that story goes and what the actual cultural, um, you know, how, how society really was back then, because she takes liberties. But it's a character that I actually, that probably was always my favorite character in Sense and Sensibility, but that character nevertheless had some pretty big flaws, in my opinion. Or, I mean, uh, I don't know if flaws is the right word, because all the characters have flaws. That's what makes them characters. But there's a particular thing about that character that I was always like, I don't like that this is part of that character. Um, and this book, I'm guessing the author felt the same way. <laughs> because that character is still prominently featured. So I think the author likes that character. But also, just like me, was like, I don't like this part of that character. So I'm going to change it. And I like that. That was changed. I like it a lot. So um, yeah, I really enjoyed this. Again, even better than Pride and Premeditation. So I'm very much looking forward to reading um, the rest of these books that I presume are going to be a thing star two so far and we've got plenty of more Austin to go so whatever she comes out with next I'm definitely interested in picking that up whenever that happens whichever Austin that might be. Next is another book that I don't have a physical copy of and that is Legends and Lattes. That's the book that my patrons chose for me to read and vlog for them. I don't know why because <laughs> um, they I think they know me pretty well. I think they just like to throw things at me to see my reactions. <laughs> I, I can't believe that they really thought that I would like it because um Spoiler alert, I didn't like it. <laughs> I felt about it exactly the way I expected to feel about it. It's just, it is just not my cup of tea. So I would never have picked it up on my own because uh, it's just, like if you like it, I'm really happy for you. It's just not a project that I'm particularly interested in. And then also I didn't think execution of it was all that great either. Because there is definitely stories where I'm like, this is not, I mean like 
Taylor Jenkins Reid often writes books where I'm like, okay, if anyone else had written this, like I wouldn't have even looked at it twice, but because you wrote it, I will read it and I will enjoy it. And I inevitably do. So like you can have a book that's like not really a project I'm interested in or not really the type of story that I would normally gravitate towards. And yet the strength of the writing and the quality of the execution can, you know, win me over and be like, okay, I wouldn't normally read this, but that was good. It was not one of those cases. I thought the execution was quite mediocre and it's already a thing that I'm not that interested in. So sorry. <laughs> Next up, I have my book of the month club book or one of the, yeah, my other book of the month club book. And that is Kai Kei by Vaishnavi Patel. And I feel kind of mixed about it because at first I was like, oh, I don't like this. I don't think I'm gonna like this. Oh God, and it's pretty long. As it went on, it won me over a bit. The story won me over a bit. I don't think the writing is very good. And I continued to feel that way throughout. So I continued to be quite irritated with the writing itself. But the story, the, the setup of who is who and what is what and what the situation is they're in and the reactions that people, like not how that reaction is described necessarily, but the fact of that reaction, the fact of that interaction, the fact of the interplay of those relationships, the fact of the political situation, did eventually get my interest and buy-in, although I continued to be, again, pretty irritated with the writing style. So I ended up, I think I gave it a three, because I was like, on the whole, I ended up deriving some enjoyment from this and wanting to kind of see where things would go and how they would end and, and that part of things I was like positive on. But I just thought the execution of it was like, was just not. <laughs> Not how I would like to see it done. For many reasons, uh, partly is just kind of like, I, I think this is a debut. I might be wrong about that, I think it is. So some of it is just kind of like amateurish, like the way things are described, um, the way that world building is info dumped. Like these are things I complain about all of the time. So it was quite amateurish in that sense where it just kind of like clunky in how it introduces descriptions, how it introduces you to lore, how it introduces you to like who and what a character is. It's just very clunky about that. Um, so that's not great. And then also there's quite a bit of kind of like messaging in the book. And the I complain about this all the time as well. I'm like, your story already has these messages in it. You don't have to belabor the point. Belaboring the point takes away from the power of that message, in my opinion. Like you'd have to be dumb not to pick up on some of these points. Um, but the book kind of goes out of its way to kind of like circle and highlight those points. And to double down on them in ways that are extremely on the nose and feel like they're yelling at the reader. Where I'm like, you really didn't need to do that. The story itself, the way that it is, it has this message in it already. And <laughs> the, your clunky info dumps of world building aside, it is woven in there already by virtue of who and what the story is and how it's unfolding. And the way that it keeps coming back to those points to really like hammer them in and to really bash you over the head with them it's just insulting to me as a reader. Like that's one of the main reasons I don't like it. Like I don't think it's a good way to write. I don't think it's good writing. But it's also, you know, it, it's like, uh, I mean, well, just, you know, in terms of human interaction, you know, if you like tell somebody what to think, they're going to be like, well, no, I don't think that. Don't tell me what to think. You have to like lead somebody to that conclusion. So they feel it's like inception, you know, you have to lead them to believe they came to that conclusion themselves. And the, a better book does that. It just sort of presents you the situation to where the only really natural conclusion that you can draw from this is the one that they want you to draw. But if you say, this is the conclusion, did you get it? Then you're like, how dare you? <laughs> like, don't, don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me what to think. It, it makes, it makes it less impactful and less, uh, it, it doesn't work as well. So I'm just, when I see that, I'm like, especially if it's a point that I do generally agree with, because I'm irritated with it regardless. It doesn't matter if I agree. But if it's a point that I generally agree with, and I'm like, I don't want to see that point get ruined by you making it too on the nose and aggressive. You know what I mean? So like, I mean, this is quite feminist, in the vein of other myth retellings that I aim to be quite feminist. But I mean, like these are always compared to like Madeline Miller for, you know, marketing reasons. But Circe by Madeline Miller does thread that needle better where you can't help but walk away from that book feeling like you received the feminist message that she was serving. But at no point does she like smack you in the face with her like, this is my message. You're like, if she did, then I personally as a reader would be insulted by the obviousness of that and be like, don't tell me what to think. But you led me there and I, and you know, I got to the end point that you wanted and I, you know, I'm picking up what you're throwing down. So like it's done with more subtlety and nuance and it allows you to draw that conclusion yourself. 
which is better, in my opinion. So Kaikei has, has the potential in there to be a really great book, but the writing is amateurish and it's too on the nose with its message. So it, it irritated me as much as it um, entertained me. So it's not awful, but it's far from great. And the last book that I read was a Book of the Month Club backlist book, which I try to like squeeze into my TBRs whenever I have extra room to like get through them. This is a book that I put off reading for quite some time and I am mad that I put off reading this for so long because this is a new favorite. Maybe not, you know, top 10 of all time or anything like that, but so good. And this is the second time I've read a book by this author. And this is the second time that I've read a book by this author because I got it from Book of the Month. So <sighs> anyway, the book in question is A Ladder to the Sky by John Boyne. The previous book that I got from Book of the Month and read and loved was um, Hearts and Visible Furies, obviously also by John Boyne. This is considerably shorter than Hearts and Visible Furies and a very different book. But his storytelling, like there's something quintessentially same about his storytelling, which I very much works for me. Especially coming off of K Kai Kei and picking this up. I mean, he is a more experienced writer. Uh, so not a, no, nowhere near a debut. It kind of felt like uh, going from like watching like um, a school sports team or a school play and then afterwards going to like a professional um, sports game or to a professional theater. And you're like, okay, so this is how the experts do it. <laughs> so this is a really interesting book on, for many, many reasons, but basically, I don't even know how to describe it. How does it describe itself? So I, I guess you could say it's the life story of a writer, but that um, doesn't feel true, even though it absolutely is. Like if you read it, you cannot disagree that that is what it's about. But um, so if you've ever read, which I think is unlikely, but if you've ever read Beasts of Extraordinary Circumstance, that's an unusual book because it tells the life story of a man, but it's told through the perspectives of the various people that he meets in his life, never his own perspective, which is an interesting project. So this is a bit like that. I'm not entirely like that because we do actually end up getting the main character's perspective at one point. Um, so it's not never like the other one is. And I don't think this book's like intention was quite the intention of that other book, but it's kind of doing that where it's through multiple different perspectives of people who have come to have an effect on this writer's life and you see him through those various eyes and then only later you get to see his own perspective and a lot of the brilliance of this book is quite spoilery i knew almost nothing going into it except whatever the vague description of it being about a writer and i was like it's by john boyne eh, sounds pretty good so i don't i don't want to ruin it because it unfolds in a way that is unexpected and the less you know about it the better i think but it's it's about very um it's very morally gray and Again, this is why I think this is quite masterful because it's not worried about you thinking that the author thinks this is fine, if that makes sense. Kind of like Joe Abercrombie, you know, he writes characters that do and think terrible things and he's not going out his way to signal to the reader, but like, this is bad though. Like it just lets these characters be kind of bad and kind of awful. And it just like, here's what they're doing and thinking. And it's not like outright condemning it as much as, I don't know, you know like as, as other authors might feel they need to. But it's quite clear that they're doing some very questionable things. And it, it's slow. Like it's not um, where on page one, you know, they're killing children or something. Like it's a, it's a slow realization of like, oh, I'm a little uncomfortable <laughs> with what you're thinking and feeling and doing. And that happens multiple times. And there's multiple times also where, I mean, it's never a mystery outright. It's never like, uh, you know, a whodunit or something or a thriller even where, you know, you're on the edge of your seat to like find out the mystery secret. It's nothing like that. But there's a kind of element to it that's like that. There are secrets. There are dirty laundry. There are skeletons in various closets. It's just well done. Character work is great. The writing itself, I really like John Boyne's writing style um, based on Hearts and Visible Furies and this. You know, I haven't read anything else by him, but those two are phenomenal. There is a lot of dry wit and it's not, again, it's not heavy handed. It's not like jokes. There's just a lot of times when there are, there's commentary made either by characters themselves or just in the narration, but the narration is often from the perspective of a character. So arguably it is that character making the snide comment. There's just but the sort of the meta narrative too, like the, the commentary on people that is present by virtue of depicting them in this way. You know what I mean? Like the, the author is commenting on this person or this type of person by depicting them in this way. I just think it's very, very well done. I The more I picked it up, it's like, all right, let's read this. And then the longer it went on, I was like, this is really good. This is just really good. Like it's, um. I always use food metaphors, but it's like if you order something off a menu, cause you're like, that sounds pretty good. Like, I think I'll like this. And then you get it. And like from your first bite, you're like, mm, okay, yeah, I made the right choice. That's pretty good. 
And then the more you eat it, you're just like, I want to just savor and make every bite last as long as I possibly can because God, this is good. So that's how I felt reading this. I was like, oh my God, this is so good. This is so good. And when I finished it, I was like, damn. That was amazing. That was really, really good. I don't know how I'm gonna explain this to anyone, but that was so good. So anyway, Ladder to the Sky by John Boyne. Highly recommend. And the audiobook is read by multiple different narrators. As I said, um, the story is kind of told from the perspectives of different people that have known this person. So each one, each of those perspectives is read by a different narrator, which I think is a, a great choice. It really works. And um, yeah, I definitely, definitely recommend this. Those are all the books that I read in May. Let me know in the comments down below your thoughts and feelings about my thoughts and feelings. Whatever you let me know, I post videos on Saturdays. Other random times as well, but only Saturdays, so like and subscribe. Join my Patreon if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you when I see you. Bye.